go. Whoops. Internet. <laughs> Today on the Uniweb Interview Show, I am joined by author Ryan Morris. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hello, hello. You may know me as... A guy. R. Tim Morris. R. Tim Morris. It's actually another author who writes with the name Ryan Morris. Uh, and he writes, like, relationship self-help books. And I don't want to get associated with that stuff, so... I guess I, I should have asked... Do, right. do you want me to call you R. Tim? You can call me Ryan. That's good. Ryan, okay. You know what's funny? I published my book. I'll tell you this because I think it's hilarious. This is this is R. Tim Morse, Ryan Morse's book, to be honest. Um, first edition. Uh, I published my book, Trent Foster and the Council of Ten, and I didn't realize it. But if you search Trent Foster on uh, um, Goodreads, mm-hmm. there's an author named Trent Foster that writes a homo, uh, a homoerotic fiction and like the first book is my stepbrother's nine incher <laughs> like you're saying that's not you that's not me man <laughs> Are you? Come on. but yeah I'm glad it's I'm associated good to with it. your research when you're when you're using your own name or if you're picking a new name it's good to uh do a quick little search and make sure you're yeah. not, uh hitting some bad areas <laughs> lessons learned right we were just talking about this it's a good lesson to learn so yeah, that is just my new book, in. and uh, I self-published all four of my books. I've written four books in the last 12 years um, to varying degrees of success from zero to almost nothing, <laughs> and <laughs> I decided to just take all four of them and self-publish them all in, in one, one bunch here. So I did that a month and a half ago. So yeah, that, that was the newest one there. So let's talk about this. So you wrote four books in 12 years. These books, have were they just sitting around, or were you searching for a publisher in that time? Um, the first book I wrote kind of as a, a challenge to myself. I don't have a writing background. I never really had an interest in writing um, or even reading, really, <laughs> when I was growing up. Uh, but it just kind of came on, and, and, and I'm always one to, to take new challenges and, and try and do something different. Um, I wrote a short story for a contest, which was a fun experience. But then after that was done, I wanted to write a whole book, mostly just to say I did it. And uh, so my first book, I have it here. This was my first book I wrote. It's called Molt. Mm. Uh, This was the original cover. Um, And I wrote it. And as soon as I was done, I just self-published it. I really didn't know anything about the industry. I didn't research. I just just said, I want a copy for my shelf. And that's what I did. And uh, kind of regretted it immediately because I had uh, <laughs> I had a, an interview in the, in the local newspaper, which was kind of cool. And I had a yeah. literary agent contact me after reading that interview. And uh, I thought, this is great, man. Like, this is, this is how it all happens, right? Yeah. Uh, but she said she couldn't do anything with that book because it was self-published. And uh, I'm kind of like, why did I... Why did I do that? And I had a couple more agents say the same thing to me. Um, so I know it's a good book. It's just traditionally it's not going to get touched because of the self-published tag on it. Um, mm. So I, I wrote a second book, and the agent said when it's done, um, contact her right away. So I thought this is good because I got an in already. Um, so I was going to school at the time, and I finished writing a second book, and I sent it right to her. And uh, she said, no, I don't really like that book. So <laughs> it's, not, it's not as good as the first one. Oh, uh, no. So then the second book, I just kind of shopped it around. I did more research as to how authors find agents and get books published traditionally. Um, yeah. Shopped it around a lot. I, I, I didn't get much, <laughs> much feedback from it. Um, it this was my second book, actually. It's called. It was originally called The Falling. I have yeah. since changed the name to The Inevitable Fall of Tommy. Let me Lee. ask you: Are was Malt and The Falling in the same genre, or is it a different? Uh, they would both. All of my books, I say, go into a literary fiction genre, but mm-hmm. each okay. each book kind of hits a different other genre at the same time. So Malt is kind of a a thriller suspense um mm. 
bit of sci-fi elements in there. The Falling was more of a, just a contemporary story about friends in New York. Um, okay. My third book took more of a sci-fi turn with like speculative fiction aspects. And then the fourth book, uh, which you have, is more of like adult humor. So, and then the next one I'm hoping to tackle is a young adult, which is something I'm not not used to, but uh, I like trying different things. Yeah. So what's the what was the inspiration for? Let's talk about Malt first off, because right. apparently that was a good book. The, <laughs> <laughs> from what the what literary is, agents say, I mean, um, what what was Malt about, or what is Malt about? Malt is a story of an ornithologist, which is you know this, right? Ornithologist, yeah. They uh, look at orns. Got it. <laughs> so many orns. Just orns. Look at orns. I also study orns. <laughs> well, happy for you. Uh, ornithology <laughs> is the science of birds, which ah. I really have an interest in birds per se, but I did a lot of research for the book because the character was a scientist and she knows everything about birds. And it's just a story about change. Um, she has kind of always been resistant to change in her life. And then things start happening and she starts to embrace it. Uh, but she quickly chooses the wrong changes. <laughs> Can we choose the wrong changes? Um, I think so. And things turn dark and things get weird. And Molt is kind of like the theme of the book. Changing change is the theme. And uh, yeah, I did a lot of science sciency research for the book um you had a lot of beakers and stuff and you're yeah. pouring liquids into other liquids Too many beakers no, eureka <laughs> <laughs> so i know a lot more about birds than i ever did but uh isn't yeah, that weird kind of though like okay, isn't that weird that you sorry never wanted to, isn't that weird though that you never really wanted to read or write and then you're like i want to challenge myself to write a book let's study birds <laughs> I mean, birds. Did, I mean, because that had to have come from somewhere, right? Because like nobody's just gonna be like, I'm all of a sudden interested in birds because I want to write a book. Like that inspiration hits you, you like an idea, right? Hits you. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I mean, I feel like it had to have. <laughs> there's scenes in the book where I had those scenes in my head before I started writing it, and I was just okay. like, I know these have to be in the book. Okay. Um, a lot of them revolve around flying and the science of birds and how they can fly and why we can't fly and they can. And that's bullshit. That's not fair. So I kind of wanted to explore that in the book. And the more I wrote, the more I realized that I needed to actually do some research on the subject. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's important. You look like an idiot talking about birds. <laughs> I mean, I'll still look like an idiot, but I'll look like an informed idiot. There which you is go. Key to success. A huge distinction yeah uh, yeah um so yeah that's my that's that was the first book that was all about birds and uh yeah so i have republished that one as well uh it's got a new cover which i designed myself which is it's gold um i have put all the books out under my own imprint too i created my own imprint um i don't know if you can hold up hold up the book you have uh, the spine of it i've designed all the spines to kind of look look the same there there we go so there's a little yeah let's maybe hold it back matthew that's a big book there you go yeah so all the spines kind of look like it's that the encyclopedia britannica look at how big this book is <laughs> it's huge Eight thousand pages. <laughs> yeah. i'll be finished in six years mm -hmm. maybe. so um you're you're a weird guy uh is that is that correct is that a correct assumption i mean we've had some interactions on twitter and i can, i feel that's like safe to say that <laughs> yeah we did our uh our fake pit mads we did that fake pit mad bro uh, that went over well <laughs> I, I think <laughs> i think some great ideas can come from just because i think we we overanalyze things too much uh, just as a society that we put so much focus on it that we almost ruin our ideas mm -hmm. if i'm just like I'm just like, oh, some fat, some guy gets tortured for being fat. And now he's going to open a buffet and skinny people eat free. He's going to tip the scales. People are like, oh, that's a great fucking idea. <laughs> like, how, you know, 
it's those stupid, just who gives a shit kind of things that. Yeah, and 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 those are the ones that take off, and you're like, oh, now I got to write that story. Now I got to write a book. Damn it. <laughs> but, but where does where I wanted to, I asked you, you're a weird guy, because I want to know like where does the humor come from? I mean, where you have you always been a guy who looks for? Yeah, the I've funny always kind of the, the, like I guess if you take me back to high school, I was like the weird art student who. Uh, just lived in the art rooms. And uh, after high school, I, I did some fine arts. Um, I was in, I took some animation classes and I worked in animation for about a decade. Um, so uh, naturally I was drawn to just weird, weird dudes that also worked in animation. <laughs> and there's a lot of them. Um, yeah. But I, I, I made a change career wise and animation wasn't really hitting me where I wanted it to anymore. And uh, so now I'm, I'm working in a library, a school library, and uh, surrounded by books. Uh, you wouldn't know it by the, the green wall here, but uh, we That's can giant book. stop in some books behind me. And, <laughs> yeah, put it in a bookcase. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so now I just, I, I do library work and I, and I write on the side and balance family too. So it's, uh, yeah, I find spots to keep that weirdness alive, uh, mostly in the books. Yeah. It's like magic, right? It's basically like magic with fewer bunnies. Fewer <laughs> fewer rabbits and girls in sequence dresses. Like yeah. Magic. Handcuffs and whatnot. It is, oh. though. I mean, like, I, I feel like being in a bookstore or a library, it's like a room full of magic. It's like these ideas that people had, they poured out into uh, physical reality. That now, if you pick it up, and suspend yourself for long enough, you too can enter their world kind of deal. You know what I'm saying? Enter enter our worlds. You never know. It's a cool thing. I mean, obviously, when you wrote the first book, it was a challenge for yourself, but you found something there, right? Yeah, I, uh, I kind of thought it would be a one-and-done thing, and I'd move on to something else, um, but I, I really loved it. Like I said, I had an art background. I, I grew up just my talent was drawing and lots of cartoons and comic books and stuff like that but i never wanted to write um until i realized i didn't enjoy drawing anymore and i enjoyed writing so kind of mm -hmm. made the switch so creatively i need something to keep myself moving or else I, mean, I think a lot of writers fall into the same category of i mean we all kind of go through moments of depression and sadness and we just need something to to keep the fuel in us and uh, I found writing kind of does that for me. I can get out get out these things in my head that I can't find any other release for through writing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is it's a definitely a therapeutic thing. Did you did you feel like you learned more about yourself in the past 12 years about, with the four books? Um I think so. I mean No like no growth whatsoever. I'm the same guy. <laughs> no, uh, the second book, uh, The Falling, is uh, the book that it's the kind of book that that I would want to read. That's the book that I wrote. I kind of wrote a book that was kind of tailored for myself. So you know, I reached that one person that I needed to. <laughs> um, and it's it's very personal. There's there's four characters in the book, but each one is kind of a different aspect of myself. Uh, sort of in different stages of of periods of my own life. So yeah, it is a personal book. Um, but it's got moments of of uh, humor in it and uh, sadness and a little bit of mystery in there too. So so when you when you uh, tried to get this book out to a literary agent and um, you were struggling with that and you decided to self publish it, uh, what did you find in terms of the? Did you do things differently? this time around in terms of marketing and yeah i kind of my, my plan was i had these four books and i just kind of got tired of of the jumping through hoops with the literary agents and my books don't fall comfortably into trending categories i would say yeah. uh the cells i find and that's kind of what i like about them and i and i know they'll find an audience somewhere eventually um yeah. But I, I just I didn't want to waste any more time doing all the agent hunting, um, so I just thought, you know what, I'm just gonna self-publish them all, 
Um, but part of that plan was I was already on Twitter, but I, I wanted to enhance my my presence on Twitter a bit more. Um, I had like 50 followers in January, and <laughs> now it's at, uh, I don't know, like 600 or, or, or so. But that's all through learning how, how Twitter is supposed to help authors, uh, joining writing communities, being more in engaged with the other writers on Twitter, um, not just selling my book. Hey, here's a link to my book. Here's another link to my book. Read my book. Why aren't you reading my book? What's wrong with you people? Um, but just really people don't like shit. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> so, so building the, the Twitter uh, presence a bit more before I launched the uh, the four book, uh, it, it, it did help a bit. I mean, I'm not seeing a ton of sales. I've sold maybe maybe 35 books or so in the last month. Um, nice. That's good. Yeah, it's more than I than I would have done without Twitter. So, I mean, yeah. I'm on. I'm on the right path here. I just need to get get a little bit more out there and get some more reviews online, and uh, maybe we'll see a bit more of a of a balloon in sales. But but again, a part of my plan is to get these four books out, work on a fifth book, and then go back to shopping that fifth book traditionally with agents, um, mm -hmm. so that I can say, look, I've already self published four books. I've got a Twitter audience. I've got a presence on there. Um, I have contacts. So we'll we'll see if that all works out. Yeah, it's a fun process, right? Yeah, it is fun. It is kind of fun. It's it's a time sucker, and uh, <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> I waste my, my entire life my job doing is too demanding. So I can I can uh, focus on on writing while I'm at work. So yeah, you're at work right now. I think you're right. All right. That's right. You're at yeah. work right now, right? I'm at work right now. This is it. Are you? You're the boss. Yeah. In my own mind, I'm the boss. <laughs> We're all the boss. Let's no, talk I work about... at a. I work at a private school, uh, okay. in Vancouver, and uh, I'm in the library there. But uh, it's summer now, so the kids are out, and it's just me and my books and you. You. So you still have to go to school during the summer. Uh, I actually I'm working this week and next week and then and then I'm off for two months. You got a so. vacation? Nice. Okay. I was gonna say like you got to hang out with the books all summer long. Like you have to sit <laughs> sit in the library, keep nope. straightening them out on the shelves. Yeah. yeah, making sure the books don't jump and uh, run away. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. I wanna I wanna talk about to be honest because I just started reading it. Um, okay. And it does give me. An insight into your humor a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's going places I, I didn't think I would go, but it was fun to go there. <laughs> Chester K. Eddie, that's the man. It's quite a boy, quite a man. <laughs> I think man child, a man child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I said boy because some of the stuff he does <laughs> is uh. Is this character loosely based on you mm. or firmly based on you? <laughs> Surprise. It's me. You know, so uh, whenever I write and I make up characters and stories, there's usually an aspect of, of myself or, or somebody I know in, in most characters. Yeah. This one there isn't, which <laughs> is probably a good thing. Um, I just wanted to yeah, write something. I would say so. I wanted to write something funny and something that would make me laugh. And uh, yeah, I still read parts of it and, and, and laugh, <laughs> which it, 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 I don't know if anyone else absurd. is. It's good for me. Right. No, it is because if you like that kind of, uh, it's kind of absurd, the humor. Like the, the character is so just like, um, what's the word? Not aware of how ridiculous the things he's doing is almost. Yeah. It's a fun head to get into because he has a lot of like running inner monologue that yeah. kinda is inserted within other sentences or conversations he's having with people. So in the middle of a sentence, it'll just jump into his head and and give you a little bit more insight, whether you want it or not, into the uh, the psyche of Chester. Uh, and then it gets back to whatever whatever he was already going on. And sometimes you'll forget what it was he was talking about in the first place, but I mean, it's all part of the humor. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the way we met on Twitter, too, is that in, during Indie April, um, I, I did a book trailer for you, too, without reading the right. book at all. Which is always a good idea. Which is always a good idea. <laughs> I, still, I, still, I still think I did a great job. <laughs> I was, I was, I did want to know though, because you, you kind of sent me messages like it's really hard to, <laughs> to do something like this without really reading the material. I was like, bah, whatever. <laughs> I mean, pretty, it's it was pretty far off base what you were going for, or was it was it, it even close? You think it wasn't too far off? Uh, it, you weren't, uh, you weren't messing around too much, but um, yeah. It it did its job. Maybe when you read the book, you'll you'll want to make another trailer. I don't know. Maybe but. I will. Maybe I will. <laughs> Maybe I'll never talk to you again. I'm so inspired. <laughs> no, it's it's interesting book. It's an interesting read so far. Um, yeah. So Chester, to give people some insight, Chester is a New York stage actor who doesn't work because he's terrible at it. Um, he's seeing his best friend uh every couple weeks they hook up and have a little friends with benefits relationship um which is all cool with her but chester realizes that uh he might actually love this girl and it's it's heartbreaking it's heartbreaking Mm -hmm. um but he also starts this thing called an honesty movement where he thinks he will be more likable if he tells everybody everything about himself uh, all the disgusting truths about, I mean, we all have disgusting things that we do when no one's looking. I'm sure you do. Um, no, you, you do it one right now, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> you can't see from here down. This is, I'm actually not wearing a full shirt. That's fine. <laughs> it's all green screen. I walk around with my nipples hanging out constantly. You People should. don't know that about me. Should, <laughs> Um, fine nipples <laughs> so yeah chester thinks this will be the way to uh make more friends and be successful in life unfortunately he's way off base and the one thing he's not being honest about is telling his girlfriend well not really she's not even his girlfriend but telling melissa that he he actually has feelings for her mm. um, so it's his journey in, in trying to be honest about the one thing that really matters and it's goofy. It's ridiculous. Every chapter is like another escapade he goes on and he meets some weird new characters and offends a whole new array of people every chapter. So it's, it's a fun ride. I was going to say it's fun. It's fun to read. And if you're not easily offended, um, I think you will laugh out loud and enjoy it. If you are easily if offended, you are easily offended I have other books you can read. You are easily offended. Get over it, for God's sake. Just, Everyone gets offended just, by everything nowadays, for fuck's sake. It's true. It's true. So I tried to uh, take those inhibitions off and just write something that I knew was crude and rude and offensive and more more sexual than what I would normally write. It's not like it's not erotica or anything, but uh, it does have a lot of fart and sex jokes. So hey. Some booger stuff, too. That. There's some booger stuff. That's actually the reason I bought the book immediately, because you said something about um, I, I eat my boogers. Like, that's in the book, and I was like, I'm buying this book. I think that was our first uh, yeah. interaction on Twitter was share the first line of your book. So yeah, the first line of that book is I eat my boogers. I think that's the first line. Yep. And you were sold. You. Were I was sold. like, done. I'll take it. <laughs> Which, Buy 10 copies. Yeah, which shows you my character. Ooh. I am a six-year-old still. That's fine. With, That's fine. With, with the book, though, to be honest, did you are you somebody who tries to be as honest as possible in your everyday life? No, definitely not. Okay, great. <laughs> Good to hear. What do you think about me? <laughs> Very handsome. Thank you. Yeah. You're being so honest right now. <laughs> It's hard to be honest all the time, right? It is hard to be honest. So part of the the honesty of Chester is just whenever he's in a conversation with somebody, it's just saying whatever comes to mind. And those are inhibitions that we 
all have. I mean, we all know when to just, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but he, he doesn't have that. And it's kind yeah. of, it's kind of freeing in a way, I think. Yeah. It was fun to write. Yeah. Um, as, as an alcoholic in a, in a program of recovery, we're taught that first thought is wrong. So for my whole life, I've worked off of my first thought being like, just go with that instinctual reaction. Um, Chester kind of does that. Uh, not in the same way I did necessarily, but like now I have to wait for like the fifth or sixth thought before I, I'm like, I think that's probably <laughs> safe. <laughs> Wash out some of the, the worst thoughts and, and get to the good ones. Yeah, exactly. But, but you still have to like, uh, I feel like honesty it's it's great to be honest because when when p when you hit people with truth and honesty, it blows them away, because we're so used to hearing a layer of bullshit all the time. Yeah. That when you pull back the turd fest, and you see what's really back there, you're like, oh my god, <laughs> you know, you knew it was there the whole time, but it's like you break that illusion for a person, and you mm -hmm. blow their mind. Well, you will find out some interesting things about Chester, I'm sure, in the book. Whatever, whatever fetishes he has, he's got a fetish for the Black Stallion, so that'll be, that'll be something to discover. Right. Uh, <laughs> did, so, but did you learn something about yourself? Like, did you while writing this, um, um, you learn something about the way you're honest and and the way you tell lies on, in a daily basis? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that. But I, I, yeah, I did learn ab about. Oh, I did learn about how much humor some people can take uh, and some people can't. Um, yeah. Just having readers go through it and, and go, eh, it's, you know, it's not really my thing. And I'm like, well, you know, that's fair, but you can still maybe critique a book. Um, yeah. for its own merit, whether you like it or not, you can put personal preferences aside. Um, so I learned, I learned how to interact with, with potential readers, um, and just the writing community and, uh, writing groups and stuff like that. Um, yeah, honesty is huge, uh, but we can't be honest about everything. That's, that's the life we're in. Yeah. <laughs> we can try. Um, so it does offend people, right? Uh, sometimes, the uh, when you so you had like arc readers or um, beta readers. Uh, I, I was in a, a writing group. There was um, seven of us in the writing group, and we were a pretty tight knit group. Um, we all were signed under an indie publisher. The third book I wrote, which I haven't even talked about yet, this was the third book I wrote. It's called "This Never Happened." Um, I had signed, Isn't it kind of funny that we hadn't we just kind of skipped over it and it's yeah. called This Never Happened? And it's probably <laughs> the best book too, so don't overlook really? it. Yeah. Um, but I had signed a contract with an indie publisher and uh, they put the book out and they folded like three months after the book came out. Uh, totally not my fault. I'm sure it's not my fault. Uh, <laughs> but the other authors that had signed up uh, with this publisher, we were all just kind of like left going... Well, what do we do now? So we kind of played around with start our own publishing group, start our own this and that. And it was just kind of like, that's not really feasible. Um, but we did have a strong writing group. And part of the uh, ag agreement in the writing group was, you know, we would always share everything we write and we would critique each other's work. So, I mean, through that, um, through the failure of that indie publisher, um, I found a lot of good good friends in the writing community. So, I mean, I have some of us still, still talk. Um, we've all kind of like started doing our own things, which is, which is fair. That's how life works. Yeah. Um, my choice to just self publish my own books was the direction I took and other people took other directions. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I have other, other contacts I've made since then, um, writers that I can throw work at. Um, but still looking for another nice tight group is, is desirable. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, we all need somebody to hype us up and, and tell us our work sucks when we think it's great. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. 
doing anything dependent of, or independent of other people and then expecting to have great results mm-hmm. from other people is pretty idiotic. <laughs> it's like run it by somebody first, please. Bring um, on the PC. <laughs> that's right man so tell me about this never happened what is that about it's it's your best book it's self-proclaimed best book. best book this never happened is a story of uh, a dude in he lives in coney island in new york you'll find most of my stuff takes place in new york because i'm obsessed with the city of new york i just i love it i just live and breathe new york from you're up not in, far from there right you're there. i'm in vancouver i'm on the other coast i'm, I'm oh, okay it is far I'm, I'm thinking like Toronto or something, I guess. Toronto. Is that is that is Toronto East and Vancouver's West? Vancouver is on the West Coast, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you you won't even speak the name. <laughs> You're like fuck that place. Fuck Toronto. Um sorry. So yeah, this never happened is a story about this uh this guy who is he goes through a lot of uh depression and he's seeing a therapist and his his life is terrible and he he just uh it sounds great doesn't it (laughs) sounds like my life it's it's self-discovery and uh what he really discovers is that he's not exactly who he thought he even was it treads into speculative fiction territory um he finds a book on the subway which he starts reading um which was originally written in, it's a fictional book that I inserted into my book. The book was written in French, but it was translated into English really poorly. And he starts reading it and he starts discovering that his own life is mirroring what's happening in this book. And there's just a lot of wacky, weird things going on. And it's kind of like a big puzzle, which does come together at the end. I mean, I like ambiguous endings, but in this one, I kind of needed some answers, but there are, aspects of it that uh, still leave the reader maybe wondering what the hell it was they just read. (laughs) It's nice. But uh, I think it's, it's insightful and it's, uh, it's dark and it's moody and it's bizarre and uh, it's, it's, it's a good solid book. I recommend. Yeah. Really? Are are there three other books that you also recommend? (laughs) I only have four books I hype and they're all mine. They're all yours. Well, that's good. I, I, um, so this was more of a, it was a self discovery of the character, but also, I guess, for yourself, since you needed some kind of clarity at the end. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, like I had mentioned about my second book was personal. This one is actually pretty personal, too, in that it goes into a lot of dark places dealing with uh, mental illnesses and just depression and the sense of feeling like you don't belong where you are which is the theme of the book um identity and reality are are big parts of that book too um so yeah it takes some weird turns um but i I think it's pretty fun what did you discover about belonging about not belonging yeah what did you discover about myself about it yeah about yourself (laughs) i don't know i I, I'm, i'm always of the mind where it's like god how did i end up here is this something i should be doing i'm I'm always finding myself envious of like other lives you know like i'll I'll see somebody online or talk to them and go i wonder what i wonder what their life is like right like where they live uh, the community they're in the friends that they have um yeah. I'm not saying my life is terrible. My life is wonderful. I have I have a wife and two kids, and I have a good job. Um, but I do find myself drawn to the, what's that like? You know, like what's that guy's life like? His um, life or his wife? <laughs> well, did I slip up there? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Oh well. Um, yeah, I think that that's. Uh, completely human nature thing, right? Like, is the grass really greener over there? What's that? What's what's going on on that side of the fence? Yeah, for sure. You hear that all the time. It's like some people will uh, just pack up and and move somewhere else because the grass is greener. And then you find, yeah, it's not. It's really it's not. not. You know, there's a saying that I love. It's uh, there's only as much peace on the mountaintop as you bring with you. Mm-hmm. 
the mount the the destination the location has nothing to do with it it's all about you like it you you have it all with you whether you change location whether you change partner or home or money the amount of money you have none of that does anything besides amplify how who you are already yeah it's true i mean as much as i love new york uh if i packed up and moved to new york tomorrow i i don't think i'd be any happier i mean i'm still the same person um yeah it's it's everything within me that 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 wouldn't change that would keep my life the same essentially right yeah absolutely have you ever been on a mountaintop i've been on a couple um (laughs) It's all, it's where I meditate. Um, I think, I think that's, that's the thing though, right? Like we, uh, we think that there's, there's peace out there and we're always searching for it. And I think that's where a lot of depression and anxiety comes from. It's like in search of something outside of ourselves when in reality, all the peace and, and, um, courage we've ever needed is, is right within us, but it's hard to locate because we're always, I mean, we're outward looking people you know everything we have is outward looking it's hard to find it within it takes time it's 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 a matter of finding that release that works for you i mean with with me it's writing yeah. um with with you i don't know it's sitting in your bedroom making videos <laughs> <laughs> yeah these are the these are the very these are the, only the videos i can show online the other <laughs> videos I can show them online, just different websites that I won't tell it's anybody about. It's fine. <laughs> it's the dark web. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do need releases. Um, I found too. I just started doing stand up, and I found this. And we're talking about depression, uh, and like therapy and all this kind of stuff. Showing up, however you are, and being okay with that person. Like I, I've been depressed since I was six years old. Mm-hmm. And I realized this just yesterday when I was I was working on some stand up material. Um, I've been depressed since I was six years old, and I've always wanted to be the happy, go lucky, funny, charismatic guy. Mm-hmm. And so when I couldn't be that guy, when I felt down and depressed, I just didn't want to show up. My body I had no energy, like I was sad. I thought I couldn't go face anybody else because I wasn't the guy I wanted to be. Realizing that I can show up however the hell I am. It doesn't matter and still do whatever that I want to do. And oh, not, right. not like lose my life over it, you know? Like I can be whoever still. Just be there's so much peace comfortable in Comfortable with yourself. Yeah. Um, something like stand up is kind of cool because you can put on a different uh, persona if you want to on stage. Um, but all of your, your jokes and, and humor would still come from, from who you are. Yeah. It's maybe displayed differently same as writing a book i mean i'm writing yeah. not through my pov but through my character's pov so even though it's maybe my thoughts it's told through a different a different person yeah a different filter right getting deep now so what this show is all about we well, love to go deep. that's what all my shows are about i go deep not just on this one but the one that's on the other websites <laughs> <laughs> There's some, Max, there's some uh, okay, all right. It's going, actually called Going Deep with Matt. <laughs> MattGoesDeep.com. <laughs> all right. We're having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be doing an interview on that channel next week, I think. That's, so that's, that's right. I'll fun. bring the water bottle. I, uh,. <laughs> Your 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 Twitter handle says that you're the funniest you know the funniest guy you'll ever meet as long as you don't go looking for other, other yeah, people. Yeah, as long as you right? don't try too hard to meet new people. Yeah, yeah, that's me. Yeah. yeah, is there is there some something in you that like wants to be that funny guy, wants to make other people laugh? Yeah, I've always kind of been that way. I mean, even with like the idea of stand up, that would be something that seems so so cool but i don't i don't have um i I hate talking in front of groups of people so like for me that 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 wouldn't work um but if i can come up with something funny and throw it into a book um that that works for me i mean i yeah so i'll tell you a year ago i was in this this room looking out this window 
terrified to walk outside. Right. Like anxiety out the wazoo. Like it would make me cry. Kind of anxiety being in front of other people. A year later, I'm like craving till the next time I get to be up in front of other people and just say the most ridiculous, horrifying stuff I can think of. Like there was a baby in the crowd the other, like last night. And I told this. I don't know where this is going. I told this baby killing joke. <laughs> you told a baby killing joke? Well, the joke was. It's not a baby killing joke. The joke was, um, you know, I've been told that, like, uh, I've been told that your kids look like you because they'll drive you crazy. And if they look more like you, you're less likely to kill them. <laughs> and I said, it's too bad more, ba- more people don't look like fetuses. Do you get that? All right. Should I clap for that one? Yeah. No, it's just, it was a shit, it's a shit joke. It's just, <laughs> but like trying trying stuff like that out and being like all right well this might bomb completely and i can I, i'm okay with it i'm okay with looking like a failure and an idiot because the the ego thing right like i don't it's it's gone i have a i have a baby joke in uh, to be honest actually so it's uh so chester gets a job working for a uh director for a, a play it's uh-huh. terrible play um but he keeps wanting to like change the play to make it better but he knows he he shouldn't because it's not his so somebody asks chester you know why don't you just tell this guy to change this and that and and chester says to them he says uh he says well the play is is glenn's baby and i know better than to stick my thing in another man's baby (laughs) and uh yeah I liked it. I liked it. Enough. That's it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the kind of humor that you can expect. That's, in, in that's this right. Movie. It's good. Yeah. I mean, Love it's sick. It's. I think it's those those that sickness, the like um, overly obvious, um, absurd kind of things that I love about humor, about like finding a way to make something just completely wrong funny. Yeah, it's playing with words too. Uh, wordplay is huge. Like you can find a joke in a sentence by just taking a word from that sentence and putting it in another sentence in a different way. And uh, that's what happens through this book. Yeah. Almost constantly to the point where you want to stop reading, I'm sure. <laughs> you just get so offended. You're like, geez, I can't, ah! Ah, I can't read this anymore. I paid how much? I think more stuff like that is needed, though. We are very sensitive um, as a society. We're I think. Wait. I think it. I think it handicaps us more than anything else. Like if if we're willing to <clears throat> be offended and then understand why I'm offended, and then understand why that person would make a comment like that, then maybe I can make a connection with that person and inf- <clears throat> maybe help inform them better. But if I just become offended and cut them off and say never speak again i'd lose the, the opportunity for connection and i feel like that's what we're here for is to yeah. connect to other people because if i never am able to connect with that person then then they're never able to see a different point of view mm-hmm. and i yeah. lose that opportunity yeah the uh when i started writing to be honest it was just as the whole like me too movement was happening um, so there was a lot of like eggshells and tippy toes over certain subjects and what you can say yeah. and you should phrase it. Um, and I just said, you know, for this book, forget all that. I'm going to just like just hit all those subjects. Um, but it's kind of tongue in cheek and Chester is aware of what's wrong, but he doesn't care. He says it anyway. Um, yeah. so in effect, I'm kind of like, making fun of it but also treating it seriously because there is an awareness of the situation yeah. and everyone else in the book is aware like hey, dude come on you can't say shit like that yeah the gesture's just absolutely out of his mind <laughs> but he's still kind of rooting for him yeah he yeah. still has that humanity to it to a certain degree um so you didn't you didn't read a lot as a kid i take it I didn't. Uh, certainly not. No, in high school, it's like I don't even remember reading a book or doing the homework. I, I don't know what I did in high school. I was, was there? 
Yeah. Was and, there a certain book that, though, now that you can look back and be like, that book gave me some kind of insight into I can write a book? Yeah, I think uh, when I was working in the film industry and I was living on my own in the city and just starting to really take the time to discover myself a bit more, like like what is going to make me happy in my life, I would hit the bookstore and just kind of go, maybe I can maybe I can do this reading thing, you know, like mm. maybe I can be a, a part of that society. So I would like not just pick a book I've heard of before. I would pick something that just kind of sounded cool. Um, one of the first books that I read was called the frog King. And it's not, it's not an amazing book. It was written by a guy named Adam Davies. He's only written three or four books. Um, but I loved it. I mean, it, it it was kind of the inspiration when I started, to be honest. I had read The Frog King again, and that was kind of like what inspired me to to take, to be honest, in the direction that I did. And it, it, it's the same story about this kind of lovable loser in New York who doesn't know how to talk to his girlfriend or, or hold a job or restrain whatever thoughts he's got going on in his head. Um, I, I take it to, to different areas of course um but yeah that book was was pretty inspiring for for my own writing uh, mm. there's a lot of humor in it too um i think fight club was another book that i had read and i was just like like how do you write a book like this this is this is incredible and i've read yeah. fight club a few times and uh for me uh yeah it's just an amazing book on on how you can take what you know about writing or making a story and just turning it on its head and, and just being totally original. I don't know how original it is now, 20 years later, but uh, at the time it was it was incredible. Um, so those are two books that, that uh, definitely inspired mm -hmm. me to write and want to write. Uh, there's a, a local author too in Vancouver, his name is Douglas Copeland. Yeah. He was the guy that coined the term Generation X. Uh, he wrote a book called Generation X uh, he's written a lot of books, a lot of novels, and it's he's, he writes weird, bizarre stuff. And but there's always uh, a layer of humanity to it, and there's humor, and there's seriousness, and there's melancholy. And uh, I love his stuff a lot too. So, so yeah, he's a big inspiration. Interesting. Very yeah. cool. So, um, in terms of your career aspirations as a writer, I know you said you're looking to work on your fifth book. Where do you see yourself 10 years from now uh, as, a, as a writer? Um, there's a Mitch Hedberg joke. Where do you see yourself five years from now? Celebrating yeah. the fifth year anniversary of you asking me this question. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah, I'll be celebrating the 10 year show. anniversary of this uh, Uniweb interview. That's what there I'll you do. There you go. Yeah. So you'll be doing pop and champagne. Woo! Yep. <laughs> As the video hits uh, a million no, I don't, views. I don't like put goals and and uh, plans like that too heavily on on what I'm doing. I just kind of go with it. I mean, who knows? Maybe next year I'll say, you know what, writing, I'm I'm done with that. I'm gonna try something different. Um, I don't think so because I'm having a blast with it, and it's it's been like the last 10, 12 years of my life, so it's. It's not stopping, but uh, yeah, I don't really have a plan as to uh, where I see myself. Yeah. I could say famous published author, but that's not very likely. <laughs> yeah, but is it something you aspire to be? Um, if I had to pick one thing that, that uh, would be a cool career goal, it would maybe be have like a book adapted into a movie and then you like watch the movie and go, that's, that's my book. You did. You had a book adapted into a trailer. <laughs> <laughs> so I've already made it. You've already made it, man. It's All right. Okay. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> out of here. <laughs> You're welcome. Awesome. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, Ryan Morris, R. Tim Morris, uh, R. to those who read the books. Um, I do want to thank you so much for coming on the Uniweb interview show. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. I've been nagging you about it for a while, so it's good that uh, it, it happened. I don't know if we met all expectations, but uh, came out of came out of retirement for this one. You came out of retirement just to just to do a dirty video. 
Oh, that's, that's, the, the, that's the other that's channel. Other channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never retired from that either. So it's <laughs> been working there since I was seven. No hey, oh. <laughs> yikes. Uh, yeah, R. Tim Morris. You guys can find me on my website. It's rtimmorris.com um, and on Twitter uh, at rymo89. That's all on there. Yeah. It'll yeah, and it'll all be linked in the description of this video for all you those. Don't you don't need me. I don't need you. Never did. <laughs> Could have done this myself. <laughs> or you can come up to Vancouver and visit me personally. There you go. Hey, I'm sure everyone wants to come up to Vancouver. Uh, yeah, <laughs> everyone does actually, and I kind of want to get out now because everybody's here now. Too many damn people visiting. People. Yeah. Well. There are 7.5 billion of us running around. Can you can you imagine if we were actually trying to make more of us? Like nobody's even trying to have kids, and there's 7.5 billion to, people. Not even trying, and it's just happening. Yeah. Is It'll it still, nine billion true, soon? Is it still true that there's more people alive today than have ever lived ever? Is that still a fact? I don't think it can be a fact anymore, um, because of yesterday. But <laughs> what happened? Right? Like it, that wouldn't make sense if there yeah. because like 7.5 billion. But yesterday they, there were 7.5 billion people alive, and all of the remaining history. So that's more than today, where there's 7.5 billion. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> that's a stupid. That's a stupid fact if you think about it. <laughs> don't, don't work math into your stand up. It's not gonna I, I have a math joke, actually, because I'm terrible at math. <laughs> Give me your math joke. All right, here's a math joke. So scientists say that symmetry is a sign of beauty, of making sure that you are attractive. Um, and they've done lots of tests to prove this. Uh, unfortunately, I have to come to the realization that I'm just a cute triangle. Mm. Fortunately, I don't have crooked isosceles. I know it's a bit obtuse. I was math is, is math has always been a terrible subject of mine, but I was great at shapes, which is <laughs> which is geometry, um, which I think I think geometry is like anything you can learn as a two year old on the floor of a doctor's office while you're banging blocks together should not be taught in high school. Probably like, yeah, that's a square. <laughs> like fuck, if I figured that out when I was three. I know what the hell square is. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, so when's your next show? Uh, tonight. I'm going to do... I do open mics every night. Every night? I'm pra I am I got to practice, man. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, not, I'll be I'm there. I'm not a professional. <laughs> you coming down to Atlanta? I'm not a professional yet. I'm just I'm just starting out. You're doing, you're doing good. You're doing great. Thanks, man. I'm yeah. trying. Keep smiling. That's the key. That's the key to stand-up. I think so. Unless you're a miserable comedian, but the key is a good smile. Dude, last night was really rough. I it was really very depressing stuff. Like I talked about my childhood and just about being a fat kid. And uh yeah. <laughs> the the host of the show gave me a hug afterwards and was like, It's gonna be okay, man. <laughs> like I didn't think it was depressing. I thought it was Maybe I was trying to make it funny. It was I was trying to, to make it funny, but <laughs> it was like, take it easy on yourself, dude. You're not that kid anymore. <laughs> This isn't stand up, it's a self help group, right? It felt like a self help group for a while. But that's that's the thing, like I'm realizing they they tell you when you first start stand up, you have to get up every single night because I I've literally written every day, all day long for the past three weeks, and I maybe have like four jokes that are okay. <laughs> you know, that might work. And I'm trying to find four minutes of or five minutes of good material. And that takes a that takes like six or seven months of trying out crap, man. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's so much harder than writing a book. Like <laughs> so much harder. Just lift some of the material from my book. That's that's fine. Okay. I'll steal okay. some I'll steal some jokes. Steal some jokes. <laughs> steal some jokes. Awesome. Ryan Morris, thanks so much, man. Thank you, Matt, for having me. My pleasure. We'll uh see you on the flip flop. We'll see you on the flip flop. Bye from Canada. Goodbye from Bye. Mr. Canadian.